Before we introduce our first guest, I want to share a little bit of information on what's been happening in the 34th, 34th Ward, which was remapped, uh, I believe, earlier this year or, or it was last year. The 34th Ward used to be located primarily on the south side. They have changed the ward map. The 34th Ward is now part of downtown. Uh, it goes through the Halstead Corridor and, well. Actually, I'll bring you on in a moment, Jim. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, here's the article from Cranes, and I'm going to share something with you because uh, this relates to the guests we're going to be speaking with tonight. As Chicago aims to revive the loop, a new 34th Ward alderman will play a key role. Whoever is elected in the newly created ward will have an enormous say in the direction of downtown, for better or for worse. Now, this comes from Cranes. Flanked by city officials in September, Mayor Lori Lightfoot unveiled her plan to entice developers to reimagine an aging LaSalle Street as a mixed-use, mixed-income corridor to provide the foot traffic needed to revitalize the central loop. But one elected official who will be key to the overhaul and will certainly hear from constituents if it doesn't go as planned won't take office until May of 2023. If it doesn't go as planned, it won't take if it if it doesn't go as up. Well, that's the alderman of the newly created 34th Ward, 34th Ward which was lifted from the far south side and dropped into downtown in the city's new ward map, straddling a one-block stretch of the Chicago River to represent large chunks of the Loop, West Loop, and near west side. Downtown voters will head to the polls in February to elect a new representative who will not only be involved in the city's vision of a reinvigorated central loop, but will be changed with providing stability to the booming area west of the river, where entire neighborhoods were formed over the last two decades and continue to grow, in turn sprouting new residents and community groups with sometimes competing visions for the future. The resulting ward is a land of headache and opportunity for the next alderman. While the market will determine if residential conversions take place in the loop and if the growth in West Loop can be sustained, a new ward provides an ambitious politician a platform to pump the brakes in de deference to current residents weary of more construction or serve as a friend to developers and fill up campaign coffers along the way to protect incumbency or launch a run at higher office. With expensive real estate and the central business district on the line, the campaign for the position was always likely to be costly, but uh, Bill, but Bill is likely to be costly. Okay, so we're not going to go – let me jump ahead. I, actually, I, 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 can, I can go into this because we're going to mention the other candidate as well as the one we're, we're interviewing tonight. Um, Bill Conway's appetite for the seat has guaranteed it. The son of a billionaire and one of the founders of Washington-based private equity giant Carlisle Group, Conway is hoping his tough-on-crime message that failed in bid to oust Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox in 2020 fares better downtown where he won the current 42nd ward despite garnering only 31% countywide. Con commercial real estate broker Jim Ascott has also formed a campaign committee and loaned himself $12,000 to support the effort. The 34th Ward was shifted from the far south side into downtown to accommodate a boom in growth and comply with the state law that all 50 wards are roughly equal in population. Now, we know that uh, the 34th Ward was quite an area of controversy regarding uh, Alderman Carrie Austin and the charges that were filed against her. Moving the ward across the city out of reach from the current alderman is normally controversial, but became an easy decision. Because Austin, who's held the seat since 1994, announced she would retire from the city council following an indictment on corruption charges that made re-election no sure thing. So there is a map here of the 34th Ward there. Uh, it's an interesting carved out section of the city. Um, I was remarking before the show uh, with my colleague Ed that, you know, the, it's an odd shape for a ward. It, it, it kind of reminds me going off the beaten path of... If anybody's seen uh, Return of the Jedi, it looks like, where is this here? It looks like the the the, the Rebel Alliance medical frigate. It, just just a joke. I mean, it, it it's interesting. It's like the weird shape of that ward is what I what came to mind. So anyway, just uh, making light of the situation, how they carved that up. But now we mentioned uh, the two candidates in the ward, uh, Mr. Conway and our guest of the evening, Mr. Jim Ascott. Now, I want to share some of Mr. Ascott's background with you all uh, before we invite him and my colleague Ed on. Um, so I'm opening up his website here. I'm going to the about. Here we go. Running for the 34th Ward. 34th Ward. I don't know what it is with the marbles in my mouth tonight, guys, but here's Mr. Ascott's credentials. Um, 
he was the chairman of Lane Tech Local School Council. He was the president of the Chicago Association of Realtors, chairman of the 2022 Greek Heritage Parade, chairman State of Illinois Election Day Voter Registration Commission. Uh, Jim Ascott immigrated to the United States from Greece when he was nine years old. He grew up in the city of Chicago and attended public schools, graduating from Lane Tech High School. He earned a Bachelor of Science and Master's in Guidance Counseling, degrees from Bradley University, and holds a Doctorate of Philosophy degree in Psychology from Columbia Pacific University. Uh, his career interests thereafter change, and he applied crisis intervention and management experience to real estate. This will be interesting as we t- touch on the topic of uh, our vulnerable homeless population in the city. In 1986, he established Ascot Realty Group based in downtown Chicago. His firm works primarily in commercial property development, sales, and leasing, including office, retail, restaurant, and industrial space, and holds a managing broker license in Illinois. This speaks well to the development opportunities uh, in the newly formed ward, as well as the downtown corridor. He's a past president of the Chicago Association of Realtors and has served numerous committees of the Illinois and National Association of Realtors. Mr. Ascott has been awarded the Illinois Association of Realtors Presidential Award for Outstanding Service and a Golden R member of the Realtors Political Action Committee. He was named a Chicago Association of Realtors Realtor of the Year in 1999. Mr. Ascott's got incredible credentials when it comes to development and real estate, and I think managerial experience. Uh, that ward is going to be very much a handful to manage as it's been newly, uh, newly formed and, and relocated. So without further ado, first, I'd like to introduce or bring on to the program my co-host and colleague, Mr. Ed Heller. Hello, everybody. And the guest of the hour, Mr. Jim Ascott. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us, Jim. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I I didn't mean to be too verbose at the top of the show, but there was a lot of stuff to cover in regards to what the 34th Ward is about and, and your interest in serving uh, the people in that ward and, and your vision for what you see that newly formed ward becoming. Yeah, correct. I think that it, it is a handful of, of uh, not only my own uh, bio, but uh, the ward itself. I think it, it's a it's a hub of, of everything. We're in the middle of, of a great city with uh, the, the loop and the, and the near West Loop, the communities that it, that it has downtown as well as in the, loop, in the West Loop. So we have a residential component on all sides as well as the business community. Uh, for me, I represented a lot of the business aspect in the ward over my 20 years of living in the ward and, and, and working in it as well. So the experience is there regarding the process of development, the process of growth, in retail office, that kind of that that type of uh, experience, and uh, and I think that uh, a, a small personal story, when uh, when uh, they formed this ward, and of course I was finding this great dissatisfaction in the way the city was moving, uh, in, in regards to executing uh, administration, administrative policies, everything, uh, especially the since the taxes with the assessor came through this year, it was yeah. just unbearable. I had to step up. And also because it was Greek town, given that's a soft spot for me being the chairman of the Greek parade on Halstead Street. But uh, when I first came to this country back back in the late 50s, uh, we lived in Little Italy above this Nea Wara meat uh, uh, store that uh, had uh, sold lamb. So we, we grew up in that neighborhood and once University of Illinois expanded their, their whole campus, they bought out that, all that other area and then we moved to the uh, north side. But uh, it, it's good to go back and, and, and see that uh, now as, a, as an adult and, a, and someone who has been in, in, around for a while. But, but it, is, it is an exciting ward and it is gonna play a big factor in how it develops, especially in the loop. There's so many properties that are being looked at right now to be able to re- be reposition into residential as the mayor wants to try to accomplish. Obviously, it would be a great boom, especially since uh, Google, the Google building, the, Tom, the former Thompson building is going to be uh, a, a place where probably 5,000 or more people will be working, all IT people. And, and, and uh, why Fulton has been so successful is because with Google being there now, people want to live and work close by so they can walk to work. Uh, I think that that will be the same kind of trend that will happen if, if for the Thompson building once that's put together in the next couple of years. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. I was going to say, it'll be interesting because one thing that we discovered coming out of the pandemic was that a lot of people can work from home. 
And a lot of people, I don't know that they're resistant to like dealing with commutes and coming back into the city. But when we talk about more businesses moving into the city, like that tech hub with Google at the Thompson Center, they're definitely going to need people close by, I'm sure, especially to staff and run things in that building. Um, one of the things that is interesting, and, and I, I, you know, I come to this with an uneducated real estate background, but I see so much high rise development going up in the loop, South Loop. Um, unfortunately, there is some gentrification that comes with that. And I look at these buildings and, you know, they always say, well, we're going to provide 30 percent affordable housing in these in these buildings. And I'm like, first of all, I, I understand people need to make money, but it's like, shouldn't all housing be affordable? And it's like, I know that those new high rises have to cost a lot of money. And I, I sometimes wonder, are a lot of these new developments that are going up sitting empty because people can't afford to live downtown? I, I, I guess maybe if you can provide some perspective on that, because Downtown needs to be redeveloped and needs to be affordable for people to live and work there. Absolutely. And one of the one of the um, one of the uh, platforms or one of the uh, issues in your platform, what I'm very happy to see you want to focus on is the homelessness crisis, because affordable housing all throughout the city, not just downtown the loop is, is a big, big issue. Um, and there are so many people homeless, so many vulnerable homeless people down in the city. How do you see some of the redevelopment or some of the ideas that you bring to the table from your experience in real estate and housing to be able to address how we can make more housing affordable, especially in those areas downtown. Right. Well, if there's, I, I, a, I know there's no easy answer to that, but I mean, it's no. it, it, the homeless crisis is a big issue and it is one of your key uh, issues on your website. Right. Board. right. I, I agree. The, uh, the, the point with the homelessness, I, you know, we see it in our all our neighborhoods throughout the city. Uh, especially, you know, in the loop as well, because we have the underground, you know, the Wacker Drive, we have under the bridges and and uh, and people are forced, you know, to, to find places where they can, you know, save themselves from the, from the environment, uh, the weather conditions. And uh, I have to uh, at least uh, uh, say something in regarding to the person that uh, uh, that's been able to give the, 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 the strong tents for some of these orange tents that you see out there. Yeah. Uh, he had to step up and try to help even in a small way, but it was a big way for him spending a couple of hundred dollars per tent on his own money. So, you know, this, I, I got to congratulate him that he stepped up, but that's, that's, that's something that the city should have been handling, you know, for a long time. Civic you know, responsibility, a civic responsibility. Absolutely. You know, there, there's been a budget budgets regarding the dollars that there were for last year's budget. There was over a hundred million. This year's budget is over 200 million. Where is that money going to go? Where, how is it going to be spent? And I think that that's something that we, we need to have some transparency and accountability on that. I, I met with uh, children and family services, try to step up and say, listen, how, can I help? Uh, my experience as a, as a broker, as you know, someone who understands the city and properties, can I help? You know, be able to acquire some of these old hotels that are being yes. you know, going to be shuttered. Why can't we buy those and you know use them as a facility for giving a room to every homeless person that's available, uh, and then have some services that go with it? You can't just. I mean, the first step is getting into a home safety mm -hmm. first, and then you supply the services. Some you know a lot of cases are, are mental health issues, which I've got a lot of experience in when I used to be at the emergency room at Loretto Hospital dealing with with all types of cases dealing with mental health. And they also drug addiction. We have that uh, fentanyl opiate addiction has been tremendous. We've lost 2000 people last year in opiate deaths, and it's coming to be the same for this this year, the 22 as well. So we're not dealing with it. Uh, at least in, in my point of view, not the right way. Uh, there's been a settlement with uh, the fentanyl and opiate use. And, and so we will have more money coming in for the purposes of, of, of dealing with it. But but I think we we're kind of stuck with certain mentality about how to deal with drug abuse. You know, when when uh, people want to go to a shelter, they're homeless a shelter or something else. There's restrictions. You can't come in if you're a drug addict. Well, what happens to them? It, it doesn't make sense. The first is, is the safe position of finding a place to stay. And then you can deal with the issues of mental health and addiction. That That's what I think is important to try to put together. And, and there's a lot of opportunities with this for essential housing. All this is essential housing for the homeless, as well as for the affordable aspect of it. This is a requirement. This is what we need to have for everybody. There's supposedly there's over 60,000 people that are homeless not living on the street, they're talking about maybe 1,400 
people living on the street, 5,000 in shelters. The others are living in somebody's couch or somebody's basement. And that, that is unacceptable. So I think the city has to relook at their policies. And I want to be part of that solution to be able to bring in. We, we have organizations that deal with homelessness and affordable housing. They need to be engaged and brought into the circle so we can deal with it. Uh, we've been building affordable housing. Uh, the one project that I thought was very good and it took a long time to put together was in Logan Square on, on Kedzie and Milwaukee. It was 100 units there that they did for affordable housing. Perfect location, easy access to transportation and, and a safety place to live. So we can do that throughout. Jim, this is so refreshing to hear. Ed, does any of these, do any of these proposals, Jim, share sound familiar? Uh, yeah, a few of them do, uh, Jerry. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to take credit for all the stuff that we put into the Chicago Corner Manifesto because a lot of it came from our viewers and a lot of it came yeah. from other people that I've heard and read about. But yeah, we talk about people, we need to end homelessness in right. Chicago. In but, Chicago. But, but primarily, and, too, the idea of we have so much vacant space around the city. When we were talking shows yeah. back about Lightfoot wanting to redevelop the LaSalle Street corridor, I'm like, thank God they're going to hopefully like keep those old buildings there. But if they're going to renovate them to provide housing to people, there's so much space there to house homeless people. You can home medical, mental care facilities in those same locations and an office so that you can provide employment opportunities. If you're going to stay in this big structure that's vacant, you're going to, re you're going to um, not renovate it, but, but uh, retrofit it or, or adjust it to serve homeless population or um, people like single resident uh, residency occupancy. There's so much more you can do with that space and provide like a hub, a community for those people so that they have the opportunities that they don't have because they've been abandoned. You know, another thing, too, Jim, that's crazy is how uh, the Chicago Housing Authority has been giving away public land to corporations. They just gave away a huge parcel of land or brokered some kind of a deal with the Chicago Fire so that they could have yes. a training facility. They did it to Target back uh, in the site where the old um, Cabrini Green projects were. It blows my mind that the CHA is able to get away with this, giving away housing that was set aside to be affordable for those who were displaced and promised yeah. they would Jerry, be able to that, 12 years have passed. Right. I was going to say, look at how long, you know, that's been vacant and idle. You know, and, and I think that, you know, we're doing all the wrong things on this. We're putting impediments. Developers can be, can be people that obviously money is a concern, but they're also engaged and want to be supportive and do essential housing as well. We, we have opportunities where not only, you know, these developers put in money into the community, into the neighborhood fund, and as well as other payments that they make. And that money should be used to do affordable, essential housing, I want to call it, not affordable, essential housing. So people can, can do something. Now, that there's, uh, there's uh, companies that do prefab housing. They can be put together with $35,000. You can create a home. And, and let's, let's, buy some of this. We have land all over the city that we can put these properties together and move people in it. Uh, there's no reason why we can't operate that way. It doesn't seem to, that there's, there seems to be some kind of breakdown in, in how the administration works. They, you know, they don't people, prioritize it, Jim. It's not an, a priority. Threat. Refurbished well, is the word that I was talking about. All the vacant buildings can be refurbished at probably a much more affordable level than absolutely new, absolute new construction, because there are a lot of decset yeah. buildings all across the city that are vacant, not being used. So if they could be refurbished, it, it could be. It, 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 is, it, it yeah. is more expensive because of the plumbing and you know bathrooms and all in the kitchens. All that requires additional dollars to reconvert some of those spaces. And sometimes the floor plans are so large, you have to have windows so that you know you have light coming in, so that there's some of the buildings won't work, but the ones with smaller floor plates can work. I mean, people got to work through that process. And I know they talked about maybe using TIF money to help some of the developers defray some of those costs because the, you know, the uh, ARO uh, at 30 percent, again, changes the dynamic of the, of the ability for a developer to, to make it work. So, but, but there's other ways to, to work through this process. Uh, and there is an interest from developers to, to convert some of these buildings. So, so we just have to open it up and bring other more collaboration into the system. And, and make it easier and smoother to operate. Uh, sometimes you get caught up in, you know, people complain, I can't get a permit through the city for the development. It takes me years. Well, that, that doesn't help anybody. So, so there's a process. And, and I think that uh, that's what gives me at least the perspective of stepping into this 
position and helping. For me, it's a. This is a. Uh, I don't want to be anything else. This is the alderman for me. I'm, that, that's it. I'm not looking to be a mayor. I'm not looking to be anything else. This is it. This is going to be my full time job and and try to create opportunities for everyone in the ward, the people that live downtown as well as the businesses that are downtown that need support right now. Obviously, as you mentioned, we're not having everybody come downtown to work. And, and that's because there's some of it is fear of being on, on the transportation and the, the, L, the L's where there's crime and, and all those type of things that happen. People and, and they're not even taken care of. So, you know, we need to have more. We can talk about policing later, but those are some of the solutions we have to look at to make people comfortable coming back downtown uh, it, to be vibrant. Uh, our streets and our Michigan Avenue to, you know, people have to, you know, to come in and see the, all the products and everything else that's there, do the shopping and spend some money. Everybody. But we have to lift everybody up. It's not just for the wealthy and the well-to-do. It's everyone. Uh, we, we can't leave anyone behind. And that takes, you know, investment in neighborhoods that need to have investment with housing, with new retail that would move in after housing is built. We have to work at it, you know, from all angles. And people, I think, want to participate and help. The uh, our ward, you know, our thirty fourth ward is an exciting ward. It has so many different components in it that you know the developers are continuing to build, especially on the Fulton portion of it. And this ward was uh, created by taking a little bit of Burnett's ward, a little bit of Riley's ward, a little bit of Irwin's, and a little bit of, of Lopez, and they created this ward. And everybody took their little cutouts that they wanted to keep, and and that's why the odd shapes. In, in the ward, but it's still. Yeah, we noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is. Like, but it's like, it's wow. Great. <laughs> we have the river. We have you know we have the all the way going down to uh, Roosevelt Road. I mean, we you know there's a lot of opportunities here for for great living and business. Well, the thing too that Jim that impresses me about your candidacy and and interest well commitment to getting in the races you do have the real estate your real estate background clearly provides a great strength in figuring out how to develop this new ward more equitably for the residents there as well as businesses it's you know right. from, from my perspective um you know you mentioned the issue of people coming into the city uh a lot of their in their their resolve to come into the city has a lot to do with riding public transportation and public safety which is a nice transition into are uh, one of your other, um, let's go, I'm sorry, got to bring up my screen here. One of your other big issues, which is public safety. So do you want to speak a little bit to that? Um, yes. it's, it's posted on your website. We also have Jim's website linked in the show notes below, everybody, as we always do every week. So you can read more about Jim as well as his, uh, uh, his uh, the issues on his website. But talk about uh, what your vision is for public safety in this new ward to encourage people to come back in as this area is redeveloped. As I was out, out and talking to the constituents of the 34th ward, that is their main concern is public safety and crime. And, uh, and, I, and I think that uh, it, it's not only our ward, the 34th ward, it's throughout the city that we see a variety of, of, of carjackings and burglaries and shootings. But uh, what I, what I, what I've, been to cap meetings and talked to the you know the police officers and the, the district commanders there. Uh, one thing that I noticed and and I they would actually say, well, po the uh, crime is being reduced. And I said, is it doesn't does it make any correlation that it's being reduced because there's been more visibility with the police on on, on these sites? And I, I almost got a yes. So it's it's obvious to me that we need more police on site. Uh, foot patrols, I think, are important. We need to get people you know, to create that trust to the police officers and, and, and build them into the community. So I think that that's an important aspect of it, to be able to allocate, uh, you know, uh, not only on the trains, which I think are critical because we've seen some you know, terrible things that have happened and people being beaten up and robbed. So we need to have a police a presence on, on the trains as well as, you know, as well as being available on buses as well. Uh, and, the, you know, that I think will make a big difference. And we want to see them walking uh, the beats. Uh, I remember in uh, on Halster Street, we had a police officer there who was working the beat from from Randolph all the way to Randolph. Uh, I'm sorry, from Van Buren all the way to Randolph and then down the retails of, of Madison and, and Randolph Street. And we knew his name because he was there. We see him, you know, every day mostly. And, and that was a safety issue. He knew us. And, and that made a difference. And I think that's what we need to go to. 
and we need to be able to obviously uh, that we're, we're down almost uh, 2,000 officers. I was, about to, I was about to point that yeah. out. I understand that they've had a very tough time recruiting officers, despite the fact, despite the fact, 70% of 2021's COVID federal relief funds went to police overtime. Right. And, you know, we've also got the issue that taxpayers are paying out enormous amounts of money on um, uh, police uh, settlements. Um, we're, we, it's kind of a, kind of a careful area I want to tread into here because we're very critical of the police department here based on a lot of the bad things that we see. That doesn't mean we're against law enforcement. We want law enforcement to aspire to what we expect law enforcement to be. But when we see the fraternal order of police, uh, you know, it, it, there seems to be an attitude, Jim, and maybe this is something that the city council can work more at along with aldermen like yourself coming in. There seems to be a culture in the police department. It's them against us. And maybe not us so much, but the communities that they're assigned to police in. One of the issues that we've talked about here is why would it be so difficult to make it a requirement that police officers in each community that they police need to reside in that neighborhood? Why can't you allocate those? Because then they're not looking at the people they're policing as a potential enemy or threat to their lives. They're looking at them as, this is my neighbor. We know each other. We're invested here to do the same thing, to partner together and bridge this gap to make the community safer. I wish that there would be some kind of a mandate set forth or some kind of proposal put forth that says that police should live in the communities that they, they, uh, they, they uh, police. Uh, law, law enforcement yep. works because that helps build that trust along with the CAPS meetings and, and the neighborhood uh, being involved in neighborhood policing as well. We, we have to work toward that, to build that trust so that because, you know, the police are very important to us, all of us, you know, and we respect their service and, and thank them for it because they're our first responders. But, but you know, there is some issues that happen that obviously, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we have to settle cases because of, of overreach. And, and I think that that can be dealt with uh, in, in the uh, recruitment and training of police officers. We should continue training throughout the course. As a realtor, I take every two years, I take ethics courses and, and my professional career. Why can't we do the same for police officers as well? To you know, allocate time for them to be able to go through a, another training, another education process. I think that's that's important. And provide more mental health support because we're also hearing right. that a lot, you know, not only are our citizens across the city dealing with no, no access to mental health, but I believe that the amount of mental health caseworkers in the police department, it's like, it's obscene. There aren't enough there to help police officers. We, we, need, we need that not only for the police officers, we need it for our schools, for our kids as well. When I, when I was at the hospital and working in the emergency room, uh, at that time, uh, they cut out the budgets in 19, uh, was 1980s uh, with Ronald Reagan cutting back. And we lost a lot of, lot of outpatient clinics. I didn't know where to re recommend any of the patients other than to commit them to Reed or Madden or, you know, in, in one of these institutions. They were there for 48 hours, then released. And once they ran out of medications, they were back on, on, on this, you know, kind of constant wheel. And I would be seeing them again. And, and that's where I got, it was so frustrating that, you know, I just didn't want to do that anymore. But, but we need mental health services, not only for the police, but we need them for schools so that there's a counselor there that can relate to, to you know, to helping someone identify a problem and, and bring it forward and help. Otherwise, you know, we're letting it let people function on their own without any direction, without any help. Those that need it should be able to to have it, and we need to expand it. We closed the mental health clinics uh, when Ram was uh, was, Ram was there. <laughs> yeah, Thank Ram. you very much. But we need to open yeah. them up again, and I haven't seen a process where we're opening them. Now, even to the level of some of the schools that were closed. Okay, we lost those schools, but they stand they stand closed and shuttered. Why can't we make those community operations? There's a gym there. there why can we, you know, create a mental health? area for people to be able to bring in a family member can bring somebody for for counseling and then have activities later for the kids uh, you know using the facility those are the kind of things that are important to build that trust and the, and that we care in the community and and then we can incentivize police and firefighters and teachers to live in the areas where they teach and work you know what the safest city or the safest neighborhood is in Chicago I'm guessing somewhere in the gold coast no, Norwood. Which neighborhood? The, Norwood at the edge oh, of the Norwood. Street. Well, that's a police community. Well, hello. 
<laughs> yeah, the police. Yeah, most of Chicago's police department live in Norwood Park. Well, that, that's the yeah. the farther outskirts of the city. Right. But, but but it's safe because you know every everyone there is, is you know is, is in the community is a police officer or a fireman. You know, and I think why can we recreate that? We need to build that trust with the FOP and and and, and work with them as well. Uh, I think it's important to work with everyone, no matter what their ideological ideation is. It doesn't matter. We're all Chicagoans. We all want the best for our city, and and we want to make it that way. And for me, uh, I want to create that collaboration between the aldermen that are going to be serving, and we're going to have 15 new ones that you know that some dropped out because they just couldn't stand it anymore. The divisiveness that that, that that's happened in the last four years. And, and so, you know, we, we'll have a chance to have new people coming in with new ideas and we can collaborate together to make the best for the city. It shouldn't be about, you know, getting being there to get a title, you know, alderman or move to another position. It's about doing the work required to make it work for all of us in the city and our ward. You know, we're proud of the fact that we're a sanctuary city and we're trying to help um, displaced migrants that are bust here or that end up here fleeing situations in their countries. Miraculously, though, Lightfoot was able to come up with, I think, $25 million out of nowhere to refurbish the South Side School to house the migrants. Now, that's great that she did that for them, but we have to ask ourselves, why aren't the same efforts being put forth for our vulnerable homeless community yes. or to refurbish these these vacant city buildings uh, that, that are being repurposed for affordable housing and to the mental health issue too. You know, this is a cyclical problem. If you don't provide mental health, not only for the police, but for children, so many kids in the city are living in households where under parents who had suffered the same kind of abuses in generations prior. So when people talk about, well, you know, kids have a choice. Yeah. They need, may need mental health, but you know, they, they decide to engage in crime. That's a choice. It's like, if you grow up in a household, systemically, cyclically, generation to generation, you don't have parents who knew better because their parents abused them. You need to start investing in the neighborhoods. You need to start investing in mental health services. You need to start reaching out to the youth and the community and doing everything you can to protect because they're as much of a vulnerable population as we talk about as the homeless population here. Right. The money's not going where it has to go. And, you know, when we see so, so much money being given to the police department, crime isn't going down without that overfunding. So I don't, I'm not, we don't, we, I think that it was a really stupid phrase to talk, to use the expression defund the police. It's reallocate resources because I'm telling you, Jim, as, as a constituent to a potential alder person who's going to hopefully win in your ward and be able to bring these issues to city council. Um, and I just completely lost my train of thought with where I was going with that. Um, I, th I think what you're mentioning is the, the, there is a pilot program that was created called CARES. And that has an officer, an MT, and, and, a, and a mental health person going out to a call. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I know what I, I'm sorry. I know what I was going to say to you. Reallocate all the money that's going to the police department. Reallocate some of those funds to provide the mental health services for the kids, to reinvest in the communities, because all the money that's going into the police department, it's not reducing crime. You, you, when you're when you're basically taking funds that could be going into the neighborhoods, you're not striking out at the root source of what ends up being crime, and that's helping people in the community. That's where I was going with that. Right. So I think that I mean I'm hoping this is this is an issue we bring up with a lot of the candidates who come on. When we don't hope we, we're not asking to defund the police, we're asking for a rational reallocation of funds to address the areas that aren't being funded that could hopefully be more more preventative measures than re reactive measures with just a law enforcement response. It's, a, it's across the board at every level that we need to look at the budget. In 2019, Rom's last budget for the coming year was $10 billion seven. This year, at 2023, the budget is $16 billion seven. What happened in these four years to be a, a billion dollars a year increase? Six, $6 billion. Dollars. Where let is that? Let me interrupt. Well, Rom, he takes responsibility, Jim. I take responsibility for what happened because it happened on my watch. Good clip. He failed, <laughs> he failed upward to the ambassadorship of Japan is what, what, right. he, what yeah, he, Those he, are the risks you take when you, when you go to Japan. Chair. Yeah. You know, the, the mayor has that responsibility to oversee all of it. But, but 
but with transparency and debate on the council floor. There shouldn't be like, I just got this and I have to vote on it today. It's yeah. let's review it. Can we debate issues? Can we see where we allocate money? Commissioners come in. They say, here's my budget for the for the year. OK, <laughs> what, what happened last year? How did you deploy this money? Were you successful in the programs that you that you were working on? Before we allocate new monies, we want to know how it happened. Yeah, where did all the other money go? That is so critical <laughs> to be able to do that. And I think that mm-hmm. we'll find common ground to be able to ask the questions, not in a very negative way, but rather, you know, we, we are all in charge of representing two million four <laughs> citizens in this city. And and yes, I'm going to be responsible and, and point out the needs of my ward, but but we're all connected. As I mentioned before, this ward is a hub for the whole city of people traveling on the highway, which is the Kennedy that comes through part of part of the Eisenhower. We have the Union Station. We have the river. We have downtown Michigan Avenue. It's it's a phenomenal ward. And, and the people that I that I've seen in the West West Loop are young professionals that are with with carriages, with their babies and dogs. That's the community that that's healthy and vibrant. And we want to make sure we support that. Ed, I don't want to filibuster all the questioning. I'm sure you might have some some thoughts that you want to share with Jim. It's fine. I mean, no, it was not, it was uh, nice to hear uh, to hear your perspective on on public safety and law enforcement. I, I was uh, in the manifesto what we call re- the reallocation of funds uh, to community support systems because that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to support communities and we're trying to make sure that. The, that that support is not focused only on police response because it's I mean they you don't take a hammer and use that and then consider every problem a nail right you gotta you gotta have the different solutions and you know and so law enforcement they have they have a handful of things that they're good at you know uh, let them focus on that. But that doesn't mean that they need the billions of dollars in budget that they currently have. We should reallocate that to community support systems that will better help the city. And Jim, Jim also, and happen. Jim also mentioned the fact that they are putting mental health uh, response specialists. Uh, they, they started that I think about a year ago. Yeah, so that's that's program. Another program that should be continued and enlarged yes. for sure. And, and I think uh, you know the budget for the police grew another two hundred million from uh, I think a, a billion. Uh, I want to say a billion six to a billion nine. I'm, I'm not sure on that, but it, I know they went up. So, but but how how is it being spent? What is it? I mean, obviously, there's maintenance of the of facilities. There's maintenance of the vehicles. There's there's a whole bunch of things, but we don't know how it's allocated. Are we are we spending it correctly? Can we do better within the budgets? And and can we again bring in more of? I think if that care program system is going to be something that's going to be worthwhile for us to expand. Uh, I talked to the, some of the people that are instituted, and they and they feel good about it. It's good to have an extra person that's there to intervene in a whole different way, in a mental health way, and sometimes it saves a, an incident. It, it, it's simple. Sometimes you have to talk about it. I, I, I one experience that I had when I was at Loretto and and working, uh, the police brought in a, somebody who was seemed agitated, and so. They, they call me in to evaluate it. Is it something that we need to put this guy in jail or, or, or what is it that we can do? They left it to me to make a decision. This person was sitting in the emergency room, very, very still, very quiet, but I, I could see that it was a tense situation for him, whatever it was, the ideation was. So I, I slowly you know, approached him so he didn't feel threatened. And, and uh, I said, what's going on? He says, I'm mad. I, I think I'm going to explode. I said, well, you want to let me give you a solution to what we can do? And he kind of nodded. And, and I said, listen, this is what I want to do. I want to take you in one of these, the, the cots in the emergency room, and I'm going to let you lie down on it, but I'm going, to, I'm going to strap you in so you don't have to worry about it. Somehow it, that worked. We were able to walk him over there. We strapped him in, and he calmed down. I was able to give him a, you know, I had the MD give him a, a, a sedative, and, and it calmed down. It was something then we could begin to talk and try to issue what's the best recommendation for that person. So, I mean, you have to step into it with with care, uh, not with strength and you know fear, but it's rather treat the person as, as, a, as a human being and, and see where you can do to be intervene and help. And, and I think that that's something that we should look at for the, the whole process of how we deal with, with everything that we do. 
Uh, it's not, uh, you know, we deal with so many issues. The city is going to be, in, you know, could be in trouble coming up once the funds are for COVID funds are done. How do we sustain, you know, th that kind of budget? And, and, and how, how do we deal with the property taxes that are causing people to think about leaving because it's just been outrageous? Uh, it's it just uh, these are things that I think are going to be important. They're important to be debated with the full council and understanding where we're going. These, uh, you know, ego, petty things, you know, we have to put them in their place, but, but we have to deal with the bigger picture as well. And I we think that, you know, that, that's where I want to that's where I want to be able to be successful in as the alderman of the 34th Ward. Um, we, we like to integrate questions from our viewers in the live chat. We have Kathy Powers asks, and this is an issue, too, we, we've talked about. What do you feel? I'm sorry, not that one. <laughs> is Mr. <laughs> Ascot for reversing? Well, it's related. Um, is Mr. Ascot for reversing privatization that we see in, in the city and how these deals are given out? And I think that that's why there is no accountability for where the funds are going because of all the privatization that's being right, right. integrated. And, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, what do we need the city for if we're going to privatize things? I, I think it's important that, you know, we deal with our issues. Uh, the, the, the privatizing the parking system, whoever made that deal. That was daily. And that money was gone in two years, a year, yeah. two years. So that, the, that they, 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 got, they got all their money back in five years, and now we've got 70 years left. And, and, and again, I don't know if we even, if we, how we benefit from it. Are we getting a percentage? You know, all these deals. No, I don't think we are. No, we're not getting any percentage. Uh, we we, we is, need, you know, we, we had, uh, no. sorry, uh, Rahm Emanuel said he was going to undo that deal and he didn't. No, he fled. He had to flee office because yeah. uh, covering up the Laquan McDonald execution. Well, you know, he fell, he, he, he fell into that one, unfortunately. And, you know, that was his, that was his finish. Uh, but, you know, I, I have to give him some credit regarding what he was able to bring into business wise into the into the city uh, that that I think was his best ability because he was a deal maker. Uh, beyond that, you know, we, we can talk. But but nevertheless, this is a very difficult job being mayor of the city. And, and there's so many components to it. But it, it, it doesn't work if you're not sharing, if you're not transparent and, and talk about how we can best do serve the people. Uh, and, and with care and with, you know, with proper respect, with every aspect of it, the way our, our employees are, they don't want to, you know, we're short on everybody uh, to, from dry, uh, cab, uh, not, not, not cab, but uh, bus drivers to, you know, to police people that need to be stepping up and helping. We have to make it, you know, a, a place where we respect these jobs. So uh, we have a uh, we have a friend of the show and Chicago police officer, Namesh Patel, in the chat. And the miss shares, I'm enjoying your talk on public safety. Community safety is a community concern, and we need to have an expansive view of what public safety means. Uh, he also adds, uh, universal pre-kindergarten, lighted streets, uh, prison rehabilitation, investing in public health are all tied to public safety. Agreed? You, you, you are correct. All of that is, is required and needed. We, we, uh, we have a prison systems. All we do is basically warehouse people. That, you know, can we do education? Can we do work training? Can we can we help them be able to have a skill before they leave and serve their sentence? All those are important. Uh, pre kindergarten is critical. I'm I'm a, I'm a grandfather and and I have one little girl in, in pre kindergarten preschool and that's terrific. She's beginning to learn, beginning to have an experience with other things around her, and and those things should be supplied. Uh, we're in public school, and 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 thank God that we still we, we can offer that. But all these are services that are important to bring everybody up, so that you know enjoy life, the quality of life. And and uh, definitely, I agree that these are the things that we need to focus on. So I want to tell uh, our viewers: I've known how long have we known each other, Jim? Oh, Maybe God. about ten years. <laughs> More than that, Jerry. I think. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so definitely over ten. I I hope I. So I hope everybody can hear Jim's passion and in his, his commitment to his, his candidacy here, because, you know, we might not all agree on reallocating police funds or, you know, how things are done. But I know and I, I can attest that uh, Jim is a man of integrity and his heart is in this, which is why I was very, very I was I was very uh, happy when he reached out and asked if he could come on the show. And I'm like, we're always looking for guests. And of course, Jim, sadly, I didn't know you were running. So I'm glad it was brought to my attention. You were running so we could have you on to talk Thank about you. these important issues. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think it's important I'm, uh, to step into this. People ask me, why are you doing it? So, well, this, I've always been someone that's committed to joining organizations like Elaine Tech High School, for instance. Uh, I went there for my reunion, my 20th reunion, and they, and they kind of recruited me to be in the alumni. <laughs> so I, I stayed in the alumni. And then when, uh, when the uh, local, uh, local school councils were created in 1989, uh, Mayor Daly appointed me as a community representative there because I was so involved in, in the Lane Tech Alumni Association. And, and I stayed there for 10 years. My son Dennis came there. And when he graduated, the highlight of all this, having my parents there at the time, and Dennis was secretary of his class, and they had me as the commencement speaker. You can't ask for better than that. <laughs> so you volunteer, you give, you give all you can, and, and it does come back to you as well. So these are the kind of things that I've always been doing in all the organizations that I belong to. Uh, I usually wind up as, in, as a leadership position, but I contribute back as much as, as, much as I can because I love it. Well, you have a dedication to public service, clearly. Yes. Uh, and I think that, you know, as we spoke earlier in the interview, that your background in real estate is going to be crucial in figuring out how can a lot of these goals be met without leaning into what we see all the time with the privatization and really focusing on what's also going to be best for your constituents, residents and citizens in that in that ward, as well as across the city. Um, let's speak quickly. Also, um, uh, you know, one of your one of your campaign ward issues is infrastructure. Chicago's falling apart. It's crumbling. I know that Ed's going to chime in on the potholes, <laughs> but why don't you share some of? Well, now uh, I don't need to. I yeah, right. well, well, let me, let me read quickly from your from your um, from uh, your list of, of issues. The city is set to receive 18 billion in federal funds in addition to 45 billion in state money. The city council should set the agenda for infrastructure development and improvements with oversight and establish completion dates for each project. This picture that's on your website, I see all over the north side. It's not just yes. down on the 34th yes. ward. I go yes. under these bridges and literally I'm seeing like steel bars with rivets holding crumbling concrete pylons together. And the, the Belmont overpass, Jim, I don't know if you've seen this. It's already fallen apart. That's a brand new. That's a brand new construction. And it's already falling apart. People walking underneath that. There's like chips coming off of that overpass there. So, um, what are some of your, your some of your vision for improving the infrastructure in the city? Well, you know, before uh, you start, uh, though, Jim, yes, can yes, I just sure. recommend that if you do get elected, that you make sure that the city no longer uses Quaker oats for construction <laughs> projects? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. For the last maybe six months, I know. <laughs> you no, know, this is a, you know, sometimes you wonder what oversight there is, you know, that we, you know, the, the departments that hand out the contracts for this, you know, they, they, there's no, you know, timelines. When can we finish this? Any penalties if we don't, you know, like, like we do when we do other deals out there in the world, you know, but the city doesn't seem to put any budget on it. We, we, it was, it was in the paper today, uh, the traffic that's caused from, from construction, which is happening all the time, with no thought of traffic concerns. They block off, this, uh, you know, for instance, they had Adam Street and Jackson Street bridges over the express, they close at the same time. What, <laughs> what? Or, or, or they do a construction site somewhere in the streets in, in the inner city, and they block off roads and it's impossible to go through. Well, you know the old joke, Jim, two seasons in Chicago, construction and winter. And winter, of course. In summer, yeah, everything's yeah, being yeah. done. All the And look, the Jane Byrne over, the Jane Byrne, uh, what do they call it? The overpass or the Jane yeah, Byrne yeah. interchange? The interchange. That took, longer to, that took longer to complete than we were in World War II. I think so. I think that that oh, was- Oh, that's a fact. Yeah, it took that, longer that than we it. were in World War II. <laughs> what yeah, is it? It's still, just like one interchange project in the, in the downtown area, to, to yeah. ramps and-, and Crazy. And, it's still, and it's still not finished yet. No, I mean, they're getting, no, they're getting no, there. No, in fact, yeah, I was on it today on my way home from work. And uh, yeah, they still need to redo the roads on a lot of this thing. And people are still getting used to it, like having the number of lanes it has. So you're still going to have that big traffic rush hour now that more people are driving again. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we hopefully we can manage the, the tra public transportation so that it's more comfortable and more safe and more mm -hmm. clean. Yeah, that's another part that we didn't break on. Besides the well, safety, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk. Go into it, please. Yeah, the, you know, I think as the train comes back into the station, they should have a crew that cleans it all up and ready to go again. Why not? This this is part of you know. It creates jobs. It creates yeah. jobs. 
Well, it does. And, and we need to create those jobs to do that because people will feel comfortable They're coming into a clean environment, that there's a police on, you know, there for safety's perspective and everybody's comfortable. They can be on their, you know, on their on their iPads and everything else. They're not worrying somebody come up and grab it in from them. You know, so th that will create more ridership. And then, some, you know, we should do some incentives for kids that are going to school. They should have a discount. Seniors have a discount, which, you know, we should help. We should help that. And, and, and I think they, they, right now they're talking about they're going to be a deficit budget that they will run into in the next couple of years, over 700 million. Uh, hello, uh, how are we going to deal with that? You know, we, we have to look at all the possibilities. We have to make transitions for sustainability. These buses should be electric and we should only get any new orders should be electric. So, that, you know, we begin to also consider climate change. You know, we, we, we have to look at all those possibilities at the same time. And so the infrastructure, of course, money that's allocated, I will do my best to bring it to the to the ward as well as other places where it needed the most. But but we need to be able to look at that uh, and how to how to allocate funds and and uh, at least put in certain requirements that develop that people, the const contractors will abide by. We spent, uh, I think, almost I want to say two billion dollars. You could fact check this one of people in traffic. That you know they lost in gas time and money and and, and time, that, that's a, that's a lot to put on people, because I, it wasn't organized well. I haven't ridden tr public transportation for a long time because I have a I have a car. But are there transit police in Chicago? Because I know there are in New York. Do we, we do we does the CTA have uh, any kind of a transit police infrastructure? Or is it just relying on some security well, they, and they, Chicago? They were, they were going to put some um, allocate some money into a private firm with uh, with dogs. But, but I think that that's not, you know, that, that's not what we need. We use that money instead of hiring a private company with dogs. Let's put some officers on there. I mean, and they, they could be special officers, the CTA officers that are allocated to, you know, working in, in the system, making sure that there's protection at every possibility. It, it, that will only deter people from, you know, causing any crime. Uh, otherwise, you know, we can continue with this. But uh, we need to look at the total budgets and all this. Well, here's... Here's a big elephant in the room that Kathy brings up that we brought up too. I have to apply for pace. That's going to cost me. It should be free. I've fallen off buses three times this year. What are the possibilities? Let's address this. Is there a possible way to make public transportation in the city of Chicago free to well, basically reduce traffic and congestion, safe public transportation so that people like Kathy, who's, who, she's, she, you know, she's a senior and, and uh, you know, she has a disability, but, but this should be for all people to be able to like ride public transportation um, as, I don't know, what, like as a public utility, a public service, what, any thoughts on that? You know, it, it's a, it, it's a public, public use and, and it should be as reasonable as possible. But I, I think we need to look at, you know, how it functions right now. The, the, uh, the RTA is the overall, the overall organization that looks at CTA and Metra. And we need to look at, you know, how that functions and where those dollars come from. And, you know, we need to reinvest in our rail systems. Uh, there, there's always been a, a, a backlog of, of being stuck in Chicago when you come in with freight trains. And, and uh, those companies should invest in abilities to be able to, you know, move throughout the city without being stuck here for several days. So there's a lot of things that we need to look at. Uh, even, even on the level of environment, uh, Lake Michigan is being polluted by other states like oh, Indiana. Yeah. And, and we, we have money that came in that needs to look at that. We have to stop, you know, that pollution. This is our drinking water. And what about the lead in the water? You know, no, there's so many things, Jerry. The UK Guardian, the UK Guardian across the ocean reported on the extraordinary levels of, of lead in our drinking water. Yeah. The Sun-Times didn't report on it. The Tribune didn't report on it. It took a news organization on the other side of the world to point to what's going on here because right. nobody's paying attention. Nobody wants to put attention on the fact that this is a pressing issue that we're all, we have among some of the highest lead levels in our drinking water as other cities across the nation. Well, besides the lead issue, there's also some of the chemicals that are flowing through uh, that, that are not being dissolved totally. They say, well, they're, they're, they're very low. Well, low is not good enough. It shouldn't be any. And, and now they were talking about because we're so lax in getting these lead pipes moving up. There was only 200, 200, uh, pipes that were removed out of 39,000. Yeah. So, very come on. You know, and there's money for it. And we haven't been able to put it together. Chicago's not broke. Have you heard of Tom Tresser's book, Chicago's Not Broke? No, no. I think, you know, what we need to do, Ed, we need to do a fundraiser here at Chicago Corner 
to buy a copy of Tom Tresser's book, Chicago is Not Broke. He's an economics specialist and distribute it to every older person in city council. So that when we're told we don't have money for this, it's like, yeah, you do. Because the work's been done on where to find it and how to use it. Right. Um, it's 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 really good reading, Jim. I mean, I, it, it's a, it's available as an audio book. It's available online. It's been around for several years. Thomas Tresser is an economist here in Chicago, who has spoken much on the issue of the fact that Chicago's not broke. No. It's it's there's no will to prioritize what needs to be done for the people. We're a vibrant city. You know, we're not going to be Detroit, but Detroit is even coming back around with the investment that was made there. You know, we had a billionaire that went in there and started investing, and that made the difference. We, we have a lot of things going on for, for us here. Uh, the, the great lakefront, great theater, great restaurants, great, you know, I mean, it just, it doesn't stop. And, and I think that, that that's where you have to come from the place of pride. We, we have sports teams here, obviously not always winning, but it doesn't matter. We have sports teams here and we have all these things that we can, that we can brag about, but, but we need to all work together. We all, we're all in the same boat. We just need to roll the same way. And I think that that will make a big difference that, we, you know, we care about our city. We care about each other and, and that will help. And if we invest in places that need it the most, it will only help the overall city so that everybody knows that, you know, we care about everyone. I know it's kind of optimistic and, or maybe a little too. Uh, it's know, not, Jim. I think the thing is that we're also we're also bitter and cynical from the same old, same old status quo. Right. You know, when we talk, oh, you're being Pollyanna about this. You're being too idealistic. We have to like continue to be idealistic, idealistic, and strive towards that idealism and changing things. Because if we all just say, "Yeah, it's it, it's never going to change," if we just roll over and accept it, right. I mean, exactly. thankfully right. there are candidates like yourself who are as passionate about this, along with a lot of other candidates that we're seeing who are going to be entering um, this this um, electoral uh, this electoral race this 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 year. Ed has yeah. something to share. Go ahead. I saw that you had that. Well, and it's also good to talk about what's possible. And, and for a lot of people, they don't understand because everybody says that the city's broke and it isn't. Right. It's just that the funds that they take in with TIF funds and all the other revenue sources that we do or do not know about, uh, the city's got plenty of money. It's where they're allocating it. It's where they're choosing to spend it. And so what we would like for older people and the next mayor to do is to look into those things and find out where are we wasting money? Where are we not? Where, why are we prioritizing things like a casino? Oh or, yeah. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> or a NASCAR race. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, instead of making sure that communities have the support systems that they need to thrive to prevent uh, crime from happening. Did somebody say NASCAR race? <laughs> Gentlemen, start your engines. I think that that was a, a definitely something that was totally not needed, especially since at the same time we were having all these young kids doing the drag racing on yes. the Caesar circle, and now we're bringing NASCAR in. So, yeah. Sure, why don't we do this? You know, it, it, it's, it is bizarre, and, and I think that was done very quickly by the mayor. No, no consideration. Alderman didn't have any input on it. I mean, I, Riley was a very upset at the fact that, you know, that that's his part of his part of his ward, you know, and, and the same thing with the casino. Uh, it well, seems that we, we, yeah. we just rubber stamped it and, and gone on. And it's well, going to affect it's going to affect the 34th ward. It's all that was, coming right next to us. I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you, because when you talk about crime and safety, um, that's going to be bringing a lot of safety issues into the ward. Yeah. Not only is it going to clog up the streets and congest traffic, but you're going to be introducing an element into that area that's not going to make things safer. And Chicago's not Vegas. So I mean, go ahead. Right. I want Ed to speak, and then I want to like, uh, maybe we can yeah. close this out with my question about casino talk. But Ed, go ahead. It's, turn, it's turns 10 and 11 that are going to be uh, hitting the 34th Ward, which would be something you'll have to deal with potentially. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, yeah. for me, for me, the best site was the Lakeside Center over by McCormick Place. That building is hardly used. It needs fifty million dollars just to bring it back to some level of condition, and and why? And they could have opened that up immediately. Uh, the true. money was there. I mean, Bally would have been able to do that. Obviously, they did a deal that they did was to be able to have another team of people buying the land and they lease it back. You know, I mean, all the, all those can be so done. It's, we didn't. It's the deal. Yeah, the art of the deal is right, but that art of the deal is gonna. It's, it's not going to help the community, especially with the kind of population that's going to be around it. It'll be, it'll be insane. 
I said ins- it was an insider deal. There was probably a lot of quid pro quo back and forth with Bally's and, you know, people that may be, I don't know, donating to Lori's reelection fund. And we oh, were looking at Illinois time. Sunshine to see, like, who are the developers and who was potentially, like, giving money to, to the mayor's reelection fund. And I think that there w- we made some connections there. But it's all inside deal. It was, it was $42 million that was handed over. And I don't know what that, if that went into pension funds or what, but there was $42 million. It was also when, when, when the company came in and bought into the uh, Indiana Skyway, there was a transaction there that $25 million came into city coffers for, from the, the transfer tax that came from that. What happened to that money? I mean, how are we using all this? There's, there's money coming in from every place, from tickets, from property taxes, from, from, you know, from every, every angle. And how are we working with it? Now, these are the things that I need to, you know, that we will need to look at and, and I will look at. And I think thank you for reading. The book. Chicago is not the book. <laughs> So, uh, so Jim, is there any, so, so, so I, I, I guess we kind of covered the thoughts about the casino. I mean, I, I, I personally don't think we need a casino, no matter how much money it's going to bring in, because basically it's going to appeal to everybody who's throwing their money away on lottery tickets that's already yeah. destitute and vulnerable. And the figure's like, well, this is my shot. I'm going to go like gamble at the casino. They're already poor. They can't afford to lose. And the city and Bally's is going to be capitalizing all that. All that. It's going to it's going to feed into gambling addiction. It's going to bring in an element that I don't necessarily think we need that we're already dealing with. To your point, the McCormick site would have been better. Yeah. I mean, if we were, there was going to be a compromise. It makes, it makes more sense. It's got the lake view there, and it's empty. Yeah, I, I, I see. The, the Airy Crown Theater is there. I mean, it could have been utilized that way and, and been an, an amenity to the city. And, and that's it. It's out of the way. And, and I think that that all the conventions will be like like Las Vegas. You know, the conventions are there because the entertainment is there. That's and, right. And, you can cross that bridge it, across the the Lakeshore oh. Drive and get building to building. Yeah, but anyway. Uh, it, I don't know if it's the done deal. It seems like it's a done deal at this point. So we're going to have to live with it and see how we can deal with the new traffic that's going to be happening. And can we redo the infrastructure there to make sure it works? If you're on Chicago Avenue in Halstead and coming down Halstead going south, you know, you're, you're, you're stuck. You're, you're bumper to bumper. And then Chicago Avenue, the, it's a once they fix the bridge and it's a two lane bridge. <laughs> Didn't they think that one through? No, they don't think any of this stuff through, Jim. Yeah, they don't think any of this stuff through, and and that's that's what's most infuriating and confounding about all of this. So, well, we, any parting any parting thoughts that you have um, b- before we uh, we don't want to tie up your entire evening? But is there no, anything you want to leave our viewers with in regards to the thirty fourth Ward, Chicago, and your candidacy? Uh, you know, I, I think we're an exciting time that uh, we have new people coming on the council. We uh, this is a totally new ward that's been created, and I am looking forward to serving the constituents of that ward, as well as to be part of, of at least levels of transparency and accountability for the city to its to its constituents. That's my role. And I will do that full time. So thank you again, Jerry and Ed, for having me on. That was a, it was a good conversation. I know that uh, from listening to you, other things that you've done, uh, we seem to be on the same page. I think so too. I think so too. And like I said to my audience, I've known I've known Jim a long time, and I and I like I said, man of integrity. His heart's in the right place. I'm I'm so grateful that you chose uh, this journey to to serve the 34th ward and the citizens of Chicago, as well as hopefully bring some change to city council here. Much needed change, especially when it comes to mental health issues, when it comes to affordable housing, and it's going to be quite a job redeveloping um, that area that the 34th ward now stretches into. But I think with your background. You're the right guy to to take that on. So everybody, you can find uh, Jim's website, Jim Ascot for Alderman. There's this picture there. You can read more about uh, the issues, uh, his history, and volunteer or vote if you are in the 34th. 34th. <laughs> uh, I'm the tonight. I don't know what you know. What? We've been off the air for t- we were off the air for almost two weeks for vacation. So I'm just kind of getting my getting back up to speed here. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank, thank you again, Jerry and Ed. Pleasure, and uh, we'll we'll talk soon. Hopefully, as the alderman. Absolutely. Take care, Jim. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. You heard it from the man himself, Jim Ascott for 34th Ward Alderman. I was about to say person. What is, I'm just stumbling all over the place tonight. Jim Ascott for 34th Ward Alderman.